the weather in Ukraine is also quite specific with this famous uh, Rasputitsia, um, the, the, the wet part of, of the spring season when all the snow melts and uh, Ukraine's famous uh, black fertile soil becomes mud. Oh yes, uh, we have all seen the images from the 1940s when uh, the Germans were trying to uh, make their way across the same territory and uh, this mud can sometimes be uh, two, three meters uh, deep and uh, if you get stuck then uh, getting out of there is very difficult. So uh, many believe that a spring offensive could be, could be coming but uh, the ground will have to be fairly dry for that to happen. So we're probably talking about uh, late April, maybe even uh, early or mid-May. Uh, so Ukraine is hoping for these leopard tanks, for example, from this international leopard coalition that has been formed to arrive in the country. Uh, Poland and Germany have both stated that uh, by late March they are ready to transfer uh, these, tra uh, these tanks to Ukraine after having previously trained Ukrainian tank crews on them. Um, also, there is uh, hundreds and hundreds of other pieces of, uh, of armored vehicles, uh, whether so-called IFEs, in infantry fighting vehicles such as the Bradleys coming from the US or uh, MRAPs, mine-resistant uh, armed uh, protection vehicles. Uh, so Ukraine, uh, they want to hold their ground now. They are waiting for, for, for this mud season to really take off. Uh, and then they hope to get enough uh, equipment to be able to either counter uh, a Russian spring offensive or even launching one of their own, as there has been some talk that they might be able to make a push south from the Zaporiz Zaporizhia region, maybe taking the strategically important city of uh, Melitopol and potentially cut off this uh, land bridge that Russia created uh, with Crimea and to cut it in, in two, uh, especially considering that the uh, Kerch Strait bridge is uh, still not fully functional uh, and that would expose the Russian troops in Crimea. Uh, to quite significant danger. So uh, taking in, into consideration all of these factors going on uh, right now, uh, President Biden's speech in Poland could uh, show the world exactly in which direction we're moving. Just the fact that he already went to Kiev uh, shows that America, that was naturally the signal that he wanted to send, that uh, America is by Ukraine's side, as he himself said, himself said in Kiev personally for as long as necessary. So as long as the Ukrainians have the will to fight, the American, uh, at least the presidential administration of uh, Joe Biden has sworn that they are ready to provide all the material they need. If we then look at these speeches, um, if, if we look before the interwar era, there really weren't that many in Europe by American presidents. We have to remember that that was a time in which the U.S. was still quite isolationist on, on the world stage. They were focusing on domestic uh, economic issues, whether associated with the, the Great Depression or later just this general process of... And of course, it's worth pointing out mm. that travel was much more difficult. Yes. I mean, we assume now mm. you can jump on an aeroplane and, and here they are. Of course, uh, during the Second World War, that wasn't popular. I mean, when you look back, it's amazing the amount of travelling Churchill did in these planes and the routes they had to take to avoid, to avoid German fighters and German, um, German forces generally. I mean, extraordinary for a man of his age in those, in those sort of planes in that, in that time. But nowadays, of course, we just take it for granted. Absolutely. And, and, and those are also, during the Second World War, those were the days when at least uh, air travel was becoming possible. If we go back just a few decades earlier, then uh, naturally you would only have uh, some of these uh, uh, world-famous pilots that would go on these uh, what, what were considered very dangerous and adventurous trips, uh, uh, having pit stops on, on Iceland, for example, while traveling over the Atlantic. But uh, if we go back uh, to, to the time of the First World War, for example, well, well then for the Versailles Conference, uh, you would have to gather everybody on a boat, whether going from, from or, well, if, if it was in Europe, then maybe there was at least some chance for a rail travel. But uh, considering also that the continent had suffered so much uh, damage in, in, the, in the previous years, uh, there was still a lot of uh, traveling by boat and for the Americans going across the Atlantic, uh, that is not something you will do uh, under a week. So uh, these, these Europe uh, trips, so to say, for those presidents, uh, they, they would often and 
in Versailles, you couldn't just go for one day or two. <laughs> you had to stay no, no. there and negotiate. So you would be gone from the country for weeks and weeks, if not months and months. Uh, and naturally, considering that there were many important things in your own country, you had to um, <clears throat> certainly, uh, you, you weren't able to give as much time as you would like to be to be away on, on foreign trips. Adam, as ever, the, the clock in the corner of the room is ticking away furiously, and, and so I'm going to have to ask you to pause there, but we'll pick it up next time. There we are. As usual, the, the, the clock is telling me that we have to bring this particular programme to an end, but fear not, we'll pick it up next time on Poland Daily History, and we hope you'll join us. In the meantime, thank you for watching.